Okay, good afternoon. <clears throat> this meeting of the Monroe City Council will now begin. Today's meeting will be the second part of the motion hearing revolving Council Member Angelia James. My name is Marianne Holloway. I'm the mayor of the city of Monroe and I will chair today's meeting. In accordance with Article 33C of Chapter 145 of the North Carolina General Statutes, this is an open meeting of the Monroe City Council and all portions of this meeting will be open to the public. However, I would like to note in accordance with North Carolina General Statutes 143-318.17, any person who willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts this meeting will be instructed to leave the said meeting. Councilmember James is present and represented by Mr. Bo Caudle and Ms. Uh, Sophia Papalardo. The City of Monroe is represented by Ms. Tara Bright and Mr. Robert Hegeman. The City of Monroe retained a hearing officer for the first part of this proceeding and Ms. Felicia McDowell serves as this hearing officer. Ms. McDowell also has the Mr. Fielding Huseth and Ms. Raquel, Raquel McGregor uh, Parks working as part of her team. I will now ask the members of the City Council, the Interim City Manager, the City Clerk, City Attorney, the Clerk Reporter, and Videographer to introduce themselves. Lynn, we'll start with you. Lynn Cassara, City Council. Julie Thompson, City Council. Freddie Gordon, Monroe City Council. Rajiv Shah Khan, City Attorney. Brian Bourne, Interim City Manager. Gary Anderson, Mayor Pro Tem. Angelia James, City Council. James Carr, City Okay, today's hearing is in accordance with City Council Resolution R 2021-89 approved by the Council on November the 9th, 2021 and is conducted in accordance with the City of Monroe Rules of Procedure for the motion hearing approved by City Council on December 13th, 2021. Resolution R2021-89 is Exhibit 1C in the Record of a Motion Hearing, and the Rules of Procedure is Exhibit 1D in the Record. Unless the parties advise otherwise, I will assume that the parties have received and read Resolution R2021-89 and the Rules of Procedure. This hearing is not an evidentiary hearing. The City Council will formally hear from the hearing officer about the report provided by her on March the 25th, 2022, and she will take questions from council. Then the attorneys for the city and council member James will have a total of 30 minutes each to make their final arguments to the city council. The attorneys for the city will present their argument first, followed by the attorneys for council member James. The city's attorneys will have the right to conclude the arguments if they have saved time for a rebuttal. Following the conclusion of the arguments, the council shall deliver, deliberate and render its decision. Before beginning the hearing, I note there is a preliminary matter for council member James's consideration or the full council's consideration. Council member James, as you are the subject of the emotion proceeding, this hearing directly involves your official conduct as a council member and also creates a direct financial impact for you related to whether or not you are removed from the council. In accordance with North Carolina General Statute Section 160A-75, you may choose to be uh, to ask to be excused from this hearing. Do you choose to ask for the council to excuse you from this hearing? No. Okay. Okay. Council Member James, as you have decided to not ask to be excused from the hearing, it is the obligation of this council in accordance with rules of procedure for a motion in North Carolina General Statute Section 160A-75 to consider excusing you from this hearing. I will entertain a motion from the council to excuse Council Member James from this hearing in accordance with North Carolina General Statute Section 160A-75 on the grounds that this matter involves her official conduct and creates a direct financial impact for Council Member James. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. 
And I'm going to ask everybody to raise your hand just because it's, it's very difficult for the uh, clerk to see. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by raising your hand. Anyone against? Okay. Okay. The motion passes. So Council Member James, if you would, please leave the dice and you may take a seat with your attorneys or in the audience. the hearing process it is now time to hear from the hearing officer that conducted the evidentiary hearing for the council. As noted earlier, Ms. McDowell is a hearing officer and I would ask her to begin presenting her report. Once she is finished, there will be an opportunity for council to ask questions of Ms. McDowell. I would ask that council please hold their questions until the end of the presentation if at all possible. Ms. McDowell? <coughs> designed to summarize the report that I believe you all already have the opportunity to review. Um, if you have burning questions as we're going through, you may ask those questions for sure, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, and it might be more efficient as a man uh, to, to leave most of those questions to the end of the proceeding. Uh, the PowerPoint that we're walking through, and you should each have a physical copy in council for Ms. James, has a copy, Ms. James, do you have a copy? And Council for the City also has a copy. Um, what we're going to walk through is a summary of that detailed report that you've already reviewed. And I share that largely for the people who are here in the audience and for the people um, who have not had an opportunity to review all of those materials. But the document that governs is the report. And I say that because the report itself contains detailed citations to the record in this case, which are not contained throughout the course of this PowerPoint. So should anyone in this room or anyone ever need to look to the definitive document that governs this issue, it is the report that was prepared to share with you, as you mentioned earlier in March, I'm trying to avoid all your microphones. All right, so let's begin with the city's allegations. And this is, again, just a summary of those. I'm sure you will hear more about this from, um, from Council for the City in their closing statement. But the city of Monroe originally argued that Ms. James attempted to exceed her legal authority under the council manager member uh, form of government as set forth in the charter and in the city of Monroe's uh, code of ethics. And so they walk through several different ways in which this, uh, this activity occurred. Specifically, and listed here in bullet points, it's by Ms. James failing to obey all the laws um, that were applicable to her and her official actions, not behaving consistently and with respect for all of those with whom she interacted, by declining to recognize that the individual council members were not generally allowed to act on behalf of the council, but may do so only if the council specifically authorizes such conduct, and by failing to act as the especially responsible citizen whom others can trust and respect, and failing to set the type of example um, that is expected in the community. So that is a summary of where the city came out as it relates to these allegations. Now a summary of Mrs. James, Ms. James' opinion. Ms. James rightly points to her nearly two years of service on the city council, largely without any incident, uh, to support her belief that the city council should vote against her removal. In her statement of the case, which is a written summary that she provided prior to the evidentiary hearing, she disputed the city's position and their characterization of the events in question, but she largely acknowledged that the events themselves took place. She understands and she acknowledged that the events, are many of them at least, are depicted on officer-worn body camera footage and other footage that was collected at the Atrium Health Center, and she acknowledges that that footage speaks for itself. She contends and testified that she was exhausted from competing in the mayoral race, 
had not eaten, and had experienced a temporary mental uh, and emotional breakdown that caused her to behave erratically. She characterized her actions on September 9th, and those actions on September 9th and 10th are the primary focus of, of my presentation in our report. She characterized those actions as rude. She also characterized them as strange, um, but not as misconduct that warranted her removal from office. After we received those allegations and responses from the city and from Ms. James, in September, in fact on September 28th, the City Council held a special meeting that was referenced earlier, voted on the resolution for censure. Um, that resolution was approved five to two. On November 9th, the city adopted a resolution that commenced this emotion proceeding. On December 8th, I was retained. And on December 9th, emotion rules <coughs> were adopted, providing for this two-phase proceeding. First phase, of course, is completed. Um, I oversaw that. And that was the opportunity for both the city and Ms. James <coughs> to be heard, which they were. And this hearing that we're holding today is the second and final phase of what was prescribed in the emotion rules. So this provides just a little snapshot of what happened during the two-day evidentiary he hearing that was uh, held in this room. So during that time, um, we, well, let's take a step back. Prior to actually conducting the hearing, I asked each of the parties to provide written summaries of their case and their positions, which they both did. Um, both were well presented um, and clear. We also asked that each party provide us with witness lists to let us know who they might be calling. Now, if you put someone on a witness list, you don't, you're not obligated to call that person, but it did give you some opportunity to see um, that both sides had a chance to identify witnesses um, and in fact to call witnesses at the hearing. On the city side, we'll see on the blue side of the, the sheet, there are 10 witnesses that were identified as potential witnesses for the hearing, and nine of those witnesses actually did provide testimony at the hearing. On Ms. Jane's side, there were also, ironically, 10 witnesses that were identified for hearing, and two of those, Ms. James and, and Dr. Cotterman, provided testimony at the hearing. Um, I wanted to be clear that there was no limitation on the number of witnesses that either party could present. Uh, it just so happened that both parties identified 10 witnesses on their witness list. Um, strange things happen sometimes. Um, but we wanted to make sure, again, that both sides had a full and fair opportunity to be heard. <coughs> also, prior to, um, during and after the evidentiary hearing, Ms. James asserted in her statement of the case that certain members of city council were biased against her, in part because they had voted to censure her earlier. In response to those concerns, I invited the parties to submit briefing about this bias issue um, five days, within a five day period of time to reflect their positions and any arguments that they may have and any additional evidence that they may have as it relates to bias. Ultimately, a video conference, a hearing, was conducted on the bias issue in which both parties had an opportunity to be heard and on February 16, 2022, I issued an order concluding that there was insufficient evidence of, of bias in the evidentiary record um, to warrant recommending that democratically elected council members and the mayor be excused from voting on Ms. James' removal. Now, while a vote of censure reflects some evidence of potential bias, proof of bias requires much more than, than that. It requires more than innuendo. It requires more than inference. There's a heavy burden required to overcome a presumption of honesty and integrity in those serving as adjudicators. And without additional testimony or documentation, Ms. James uh, simply fell short of meeting that heavy burden of showing that council members' opinions were not susceptible to change. So that's the legal standard, right? You're biased if your opinions are not susceptible to change based on what is presented in the evidentiary record. To preserve any impact on Ms. James' due process rights, which were foremost in my mind, I offered her the opportunity to question each of you um, and the mayor in a limited inquiry to assess whether or not there was indeed any bias. Ms. James, however, declined to exercise that right. Um, so that's where we landed on the issue of bias coming into the hearing. Next, I want to walk through a summary of the proposed findings of fact that are set forth in a great deal of detail in the, the detailed report that you've seen. 
Um, I'm going to do that by showing you on the next page, and I don't know if we have physical copies of the timeline, larger physical copies of the timeline, that with your permission, Mayor, we'll hand up to you for review and, and share with Council. But it's also reflected in the PowerPoint and smaller pages. We thought a timeline would be helpful because there are so many facts um, in this case, and we really wanted to try to distill them. So once we get these distributed, we'll start to walk through these facts. Everybody, everybody set? Okay, so for context, um, on the timeline, some of the facts are reflected in blue and some of the facts are reflected in red. This is intentional. Um, a number of the facts that are in blue don't go directly to whether or not Ms. James engaged in misconduct. They're being offered to you to give you some context about the events of the day. The, the events that are in red, those events go more directly to the allegations of whether or not there was misconduct. So beginning, um, right at the beginning as we do, um, Ms. James woke up at 5 a.m. in the morning on September the 8th, and she testified that God woke her up and told her to look at a house that had been for sale, but that was currently under contract. Why are we talking about this house? It'll make sense in a little bit. That morning, Ms. James testified that she called a real estate agent for that house that was listed, but was already under contract, approximately seven times before 9 a.m. in the morning. Shortly after 9 a.m., and on her eighth uh, attempt, and again, she's estimating, but on her eighth attempt, the real estate agent answered the phone and told her that the house was under contract and therefore not available for showing. She persisted nonetheless, and the agent eventually told Ms. James that she could see the house in the afternoon. I'm offering this information to you that is all in the record to tip, just to give you some context for how she was behaving in the morning. According to Ms. James' own testimony, she described this as strange behavior as it related to the home. Right? So this is right out of the gate before any of the alleged misconduct takes place. At approximately 10 o'clock in the morning, and you see this on the timeline, Ms. James met a reporter from the Inquirer Journal at a local cafe to discuss the mayoral race. At that meeting, she had a smoothie. This is gonna be a very important fact to us as we consider the rest of the information from the day. She had a smoothie during that hour-long interview, but she did testify that she didn't, hadn't eaten anything else in the morning before that time. Afterwards, Ms. James called Police Chief Gilliard on his cell phone at 11.15, but was not able to connect with him at that time. So what you'll see on the timeline is her next opportunity to speak with him came at noon that day. So we're now at noon, no more than two hours after she consumed that smoothie. At that point in time, Chief Gilliard returned Ms. James' telephone call, and Ms. James asked him when he planned to retire from the police department. He explained that he was eligible for retirement in May 2022, but had a personal goal of remaining in the police department until the completion of the new police building, which was not projected to be completed until sometime in 2023. According to Chief Gilliard's testimony, um, Ms. James then said that, quote, he needed to leave his position as chief of police in 2022, and that she intended to promote Mark Isley to, assi to assistant police chief three short months away in December 2021. Ms. James further added that Mark Isley would become the police chief, um, excuse me, she was gonna promote Mark Isley to assistant police chief in three months, and that he would then become the police chief in May 2022, and that if elected mayor, because she was in fact running for mayor at this time, she had the votes to appoint a new city manager to remove Chief Gilliard. So this was a lot, according to the testimony in the record, and Chief Gilliard testified that he experienced a range of emotions in response to this interaction with Ms. James, because according to him, and this is a quote, he'd worked his whole life to make this place the best police department and best community he could. This event, this call with Chief Gilliard, way before any of the events that we more, re more frequently have seen um, in the police body camera footage, this was the first act of potential misconduct by Ms. Um, James that day. 
So two hours after the smoothie, very early in the day, hours before the events at the Fairfield Inn. Um, those events occurred beginning at 7, as you can see on the timeline. We are still talking at noon, so much broader range of activity. The state picked her young son up from school at approximately 3 o'clock in the afternoon and took him to see that house that we discussed earlier, the one that was under contract and not available for purchase. At approximately 4 p.m., Ms. James and her son returned home, and Ms. James testified that she told her husband she'd found a new house and that they were, quote, going to sell this house, the one that they were living in, and that that was it, end quote. She recalls that her husband was puzzled by this behavior, and again, according to her, this is part of the ongoing strange behavior that relates to this house purchase over the course of the day. According to Ms. James' testimony, to avoid an argument with her husband, she decided that she and her son would stay at the Fairfield Inn and Suites for the evening. And that's what they did. In the early evening, let me make sure that everybody in the room can see these. In the early evening, Ms. James arrived at the hotel, the Fairfield Inn and Suites, where she testified that she perceived that there were some felons in the hotel lobby. She further testified that she believed the, that the bystanders in the lobby were felons because, quote, God was speaking to her and told her so. Ms. James then approached a black man in a yellow worker's vest and asked him to take his mask off, his COVID mask, right, during the September time frame. Ms. James testified that the interaction with that man left her feeling unsafe, so she called Chief Gilliard directly on his cell phone, not 911, but directly a call to the chief, and she asked him to send an officer to check out the hotel. At the same time, unknown to Ms. James, the hotel had also contacted police in response to her behavior. Shortly before 7, Officer Reagan Broom and Timothy, officers Reagan Broom and Officer Timothy Sykes responded to a call that a man in a yellow vest at the Fairfield Inn and Suites was potentially wanted for murder. A hotel employee told officers Broom and Sykes upon arriving that Ms. James had been harassing customers and that they wanted her to leave. Shortly thereafter, Officer Brantley Birch Birchmore responded to the hotel and spoke to a hotel employee who told him that Ms. James had approached a man in the lobby and accused him of being a felon. The officers then spoke with Ms. James, who directed them to locate and arrest the individual in the yellow vest, but the officers did not comply with that instruction. Ms. James then called Chief Gilliard on his cell phone again and asked him to have the officers arrest the felons at the hotel, but Chief Gilliard told her that the <coughs> officers could not do that. Following the call with Chief Gilliard, Mr. Ms. James made several negative remarks to Officer Broom about her facial expressions and her body language. We have those video clips. Um, they're embedded in, the, in this PowerPoint. We can play them if we need. I suspect that they may be played by either of the parties. I don't intend to play them unless that is something that you need to see um, as part of this presentation. Ms. James stated in her exchange with Officer Broom that she was a city council member and that Officer Broom needed to show her respect and change her body language. Several other police officers, Lieutenant Nick Brummer, Captain William Bolin, Sergeant Adam Craig, all of them testified, also responded to the hotel and were told by Ms. James that the black male in the yellow vest was either wanted for murder or was a wanted felon. Sergeant Craig and Lieutenant Brummer spoke to the man in the yellow vest obtained his identification card, and ran searches for any warrants against him. Ms. James then accused other black men in the hotel lobby of being felons and instructed the police to arrest them. The police officers did not comply with Ms. James' instruction. In her testimony, Ms. James acknowledged that insisting police officers go room by room to check the hotel, which is what she did, she acknowledged that that behavior was strange. Outside the hotel, paramedics checked Ms. James' vitals and asked her some questions, which she permitted them to do. After the paramedics left, Ms. James had an encounter with Captain Bolin, Sergeant Craig, and Officer Birchmore, 
wherein she attempted to physically remove Captain Boland's police badge and indicated her intent to demote him from the rank of captain. That incident was also captured on video, and that video, as you know, is also in the record. At approximately 7.50, almost eight hours after the initial call to Chief Gilliard, Chief Gilliard then called Lieutenant Monica Holt, who he described as being very well-versed in handling situations like this. He asked Lieutenant Holt to respond to the Fairfield Inn. She was off duty at a football game that happened to be being coached by Miss James' husband, Tony James. As requested by the chief, Lieutenant Holt informed Mr. James of the events that were occurring at the Fairfield Inn, and she and Ms. Mr. James <coughs> drove separately to the hotel where they found Ms. James and officers gathered outside. And the next thing that occurred is a very important fact. It doesn't show up on the timeline. It's detailed in the report. Mr. James, according to Officer Birchmore, um, Mr. James told Officer Birchmore and Captain Bowen that a similar incident involving Ms. James had occurred 10 to 12 years earlier. According to Officer Birchmore, Mr. James, who did not testify at the evidentiary hearing, said that the Jameses were at church when, quote, something happened in which Ms. James believed she had spoken to God. And after that, Mr. and Ms. James had to remove themselves from the church. According to Officer Birchmore, Mr. James indicated that Ms. James had some arguments at the church as a result of this event. He also told Officer Birchmore that Ms. James never sought mental or medical treatment relating to that prior event. So that conversation all took place at around 7.50 or 8 o'clock at the Fairfield Inn and Suites. At some point, while all of the parties were still outside the Fairfield Inn, Ms. James became upset. She began crying, and she said she was tired. Did we need to take a pause? There, there's feedback. And it's in the case behind you, Brian. Yes, we're auto tuning all. It's fine. It's fine. I want to make sure it's clear for everyone. So at some point after this exchange between Mr. James and the officers, folks were gathered outside at the Fairfield Inn. Ms. James became upset, and she was crying, and she was tired. Lieutenant Holt and Sergeant Craig helped Ms. James enter her husband's truck, and she and Ms. Mr. James returned to their home, or at least left to return to their home, which was three miles down the road, looks like seven miles on, or seven minutes drive on MapQuest. The officers and Ms. James left the Fairfield Inn, as you can see on the timeline, at approximately 8.50 that evening. About 15, 10 or 15 minutes later, Ms. James called Lieutenant Holt on her cell phone and said that her husband was, quote, taking her son. Lieutenant Holt, who had been driving home from the Fairfield Inn, told Ms. James that she would drive to Ms. James' house. Lieutenant Holt then called Chief Gilliard and Lieutenant Brummer and she told Lieutenant Brummer that Mr. and Mrs. James were having an argument at the residence and that officers should go there. While driving to Ms. James' residence and while Ms. James was calling her back, Lieutenant Holt herself got into a car accident and was subsequently transported to Atrium Health Union Hospital. At approximately 9.05, Lieutenant Brummer then requested assistance responding to the James home via police radio. Lieutenant Brummer, Sergeant Craig, Officer Birchmore, and Captain Bolin responded to the house and requested EMS services. 
because they knew that Ms. James was not doing well. She indicated that she felt pressure in her chest and she felt like she was going to throw up. Paramedics did arrive and they did work with Ms. James. They determined that her blood pressure and her heart appeared to be normal at that time. Shortly thereafter, Ms. James told the police officers that she had, quote, fired Chief Gilliard, I think she said fire Brian, so that Mark Isley is the chief. So if y'all don't like Mark Isley as the chief of police for city of Monroe, then you're not gonna be on the force. That exchange was also recorded on a police body camera and is part of the record that is before you. Ms. James also told paramedics that certain officers, including Officer Birchmore, had been promoted to captain. Separately, Ms. James directed Sergeant Craig to hold her water cup and escort her to the bathroom and other parts of her home. Sergeant Craig testified that he allowed Ms. James to direct him to do these things because she was a sitting city council person. Ms. James eventually allowed EMS to transport her to Atrium Health Union Hospital. The officers left the scene before EMS departed. Ms. James arrived at Union Hospital, or excuse me, Atrium Health Union Hospital sometime before 11 p.m. on the evening again of September the 9th. Officer Acock arrived at the hospital after responding to the car accident involving Lieutenant Holt at around 11 p.m. And he spoke to the paramedic who brought Ms. James in. According to Officer Acock's, A Acock's testimony, Ms. James was really kind of manic when she came in. She was fidgety and she was all over the place. Officer Acock knew Ms. James from the community and he considered them to be friends of one another. Um, Ms. James also considered them to be friends prior to this event. Officer Acock tried to assist Ms. James with getting a private room at the hospital because he thought it best knowing her position as a council member. While inquiring at the nurse's station about a private room, Ms. James, according to Officer Acock, Ms. James became, quote, irate and pushed away. And then he snatched the COVID mask that he was wearing off of his face. Due to the pandemic, North Carolina law required the wearing of facial masks in hospital settings when this occurred. In fact, it still requires, the law still requires wearing a facial mask in a hospital setting. Officer Aikoff testified that Ms. James' conduct towards him was an assault, a criminal assault, but that he did not arrest or charge her because she is a council member. He testified, however, that he believed he had discretion to arrest her, had he so chosen to do that under the circumstances. Officer Acoff then requested assistance via police radio and shortly thereafter, other police officers arrived at the hospital. Ms. James refused a hospital worker's instruction to wear a face mask, which again was required under the law at the time. Around the same time, hospital staff also complained that Ms. James was going into other people's rooms at the hospital. That was recorded by video. That video is in the record. Ms. James subsequently told several officers present, including officers Baznakis, I'm sure I'm destroying her name, Captain Bolin, Lieutenant Brummer, um, or excuse me, uh, I'm destroying his name, Captain Bolin, Lieutenant Brummer, and Officer Acoff, that they were all fired or they were going to be fired. That exchange was also recorded and it is also in the record before you. She further stated that Captain Bolin had been fired earlier in the day because he doesn't like black people. Shortly after, medical staff ran tests on Ms. James and administered two shots of medication to sedate her. And the, efficient, the physician's assistant at Atrium Health wrote in Ms. James' medical chart that she had suffered from an episode of acute psychosis. So that was what was in her medical record at the time. So those are the principal events. Um, as you know, that there, there are more specific facts that, are, that were included in that in the report but at a high level. That is, in fact, what happened and what is the subject of this, of this review. It's important to understand what Ms. James had to say about her conduct um, on the 9th and the 10th. She testified at the hearing that she regretted having stated that the police officers were fired or were going to be fired. She also regretted saying that Captain Boland does not like black people. She separately admitted to pulling Officer Acock's mask off his face. 
In her testimony about her conduct throughout the day, Ms. James confirmed her understanding that God speaks to her and at times tells her to do certain things. But she also testified and acknowledged that sometimes she does not interpret what God says perfectly and does not always completely understand or appreciate what God is telling her. She described her conduct, she said, in retrospect, it surprised her because she wasn't behaving like the Angelia James the community voted for, or the Angelia James that they've grown to love and respect. She very, very clearly added that she is a person who cares about the community, respects her community, and works together with those in her community to build relationships. There was no dispute about those issues in the record. Let's talk a little bit now about Ms. James' mental health and what's in the record on that subject. <clears throat> in her testimony, Ms. James stated that she believed that she had experienced some sort of mental issue or mental illness on the evening of September 9th. She said that it was not her normal state of mind um, that evening, that she described it as an isolated incident, the kind of thing that could happen to anyone, to any one of us. Ms. James introduced no evidence that she's received or plans to receive mental health treatment or is otherwise taking steps to determine whether such events may occur again or taking steps to mitigate the risk that it may occur again. The record contains minimal evidence of medical treatment that Ms. James has received. As it relates to those specific, those specific events, on the 9th and 10th, no party to this proceeding introduced medical records or testimony from any of the many medical professionals who interacted with or attended to Ms. James at the Fairfield Inn, her house, or Atrium Health Union Hospital. Ms. James testified that she visited a therapist named Tia Coleman on October 1st or 2nd, several weeks after this event and that she visited a psychiatrist named Dr. Kimberly Gordon on November 2nd, 2021, which was election day, but she offered little to no evidence about the reasons for those visits or the treatment she received from either of those professionals, if any. Let's talk about the evidence from her testifying expert, Dr. Cotterman. So, Ms. James' counsel presented a uh, testifying expert, Dr. Dan Cotterman, a psychiatrist with many years of training, who Ms. James retained to testify in the proceeding. He concluded that on September 9th, 2021, Ms. James likely experienced an episode of delirium. And he described delirium as a mental illness that occurs over a short period of time. Dr. Cotterman testified that hypoglycemia or as other people know it, low blood sugar, was likely the physical trigger for the delirium onset. He prepared a written memorandum that is part of the record. And in that memorandum, he concluded that she experienced hypoglycemia in part because she didn't eat anything that day. But that was inconsistent with the record evidence. Dr. Cotterman testified that he did not communicate with any of the medical professionals who treated Ms. James during or after the events of September 9th and 10th. He testified that he did review medical records from her visit to Atrium Health on 9 and 10, September 9 and 10, and he reached conclusions about those records and the diagnoses that are reflected therein without speaking to any of the treating physicians or other medical professionals that were involved. Specifically, he observed that Ms. James received a diagnosis of acute psychosis. We talked about that. Acute psychosis was the, the treating um, diagnosis at the hospital. Dr. Kahneman reached a different diagnosis, delirium. Dr. Kahneman neither communicated with the doctor who gave the diagnosis at the hospital or the physician's assistant who wrote it down. But in his testimony, he concluded that the doctor, quote, probably meant psychotic disorder. But he offered no reasoning, no evidence rather, to support that conclusion. Dr. Cotterman did not speak with or acquire medical records 
from Ms. Coleman, the therapist that Ms. James visited a few weeks after this event. He did not speak with or acquire medical records from Dr. Kimberly Gordon, the, the, excuse me, the psychiatrist Ms. James visited on election day, November 2nd. Dr. Kahneman testified that he understood that Dr. Gordon, the psychiatrist, had performed a formal evaluation on Ms. James, but he never requested it, he never reviewed it, and it isn't part of this record for you to review. Dr. Kahneman also did not thoroughly investigate Ms. James' prior health incident, the one from 10 to 12 years ago involving her church. According to his own testimony, all he did was speak to Ms. James about it for a few minutes. He admitted that he didn't have enough data to say or provide an opinion about that incident. But despite being aware of the incident, he didn't address it in his memorandum, and he described the incident on September 9 and 10 as an isolated incident, one that had not happened previously. On September, make sure that I've given you all of this information. All of these things together, um, yeah, missing one of these. In addition to the items that I just talked about, about the, the process that Dr. Common went through, there were also a number of inconsistencies that are laid out in the report um, about what was included in Dr. Kahneman's testimony versus what was included in his written material. Um, a lot of this turns on the timing. So for example, in his uh, written report, Dr. Kahneman said, it's hypoglycemia is the trigger. That's the only trigger that he offered. He said it was a trigger because Ms. Um, Ms. James had not eaten all day, but his report actually said that she had consumed a smoothie at 2.30 in the afternoon. That is not true. She did consume a smoothie that day. It was at 10 o'clock in the morning, or there's about when she was at the meeting. So there were factual inaccuracies in his written report around the timing. But he said all of this was triggered by hypoglycemia. He was questioned, how long does it take for someone to have a trigger of hypoglycemia? How long do you have to go without eating? His answer was six hours or half a day. Now, that explanation works if you believe that the first act of misconduct occurred at the Fairfield Inn. But we know that the first act of misconduct happened earlier in the day. It happened when the call went to Chief Gilliam directing him that he was going to leave his position earlier than he had originally intended. That call happened at noon. We also know that when Ms. James woke up, she was already behaving strangely before all of this. So before the smoothie, after the smoothie, and well into the day. So the timing, all of those are inconsistencies across, across his testimony. So these are all the things that are laid out in, in a lot of detail in the report that we want to make sure that you pay attention to. In, in my analysis, I placed very little um, support on that testimony. I would have preferred to have had much more record evidence around Ms. James' uh, mental health to be able to talk to you about today, but we don't have very much in the way of reliable evidence from my perspective. You will have to weigh that evidence yourself as you make your own determination. One last issue, um, one last factual issue before we get to the conclusions of law. Um, as I think most of you are aware, Back in 2012, the City Council voted to conduct an independent analysis concerning the relationship between the then mayor, City Council, and City Manager's office, and the staff of the City of Monroe. City Council hired the law firm of Parker Poe, Adams and Bernstein to conduct that independent analysis, and they found, among other things, that several council members at the time were trying to influence personnel decisions within the city. The city did not remove those council members following Parker Poe's findings. The Parker Poe report is part of the evidentiary record in this proceeding, and we'll talk about it a little bit more as we get through some of the conclusions of law. So, my report contained two big chunks. The first was proposed findings of fact, the second was proposed conclusions of law. After careful consideration of the evidence presented, 
I concluded that Ms. James has in fact engaged in misconduct related to the duties of her office and that just cause exists to remove Ms. James from office. As I discussed in the report and as I will discuss with you tonight, just because you can remove Ms. James from office certainly does not mean that you have to. That is a decision for you to weigh. It's important to note that Ms. James received notice and she had an opportunity to be heard in this proceeding. Um, and she has not shown that the motion proceeding would be decided by a biased or impartial set of decision makers. As I set forth in my order on bias, which is part of the record, uh, again, what she presented around the issue of bias was insufficient to meet her burden. And as I mentioned earlier, I offered her the opportunity to question any of you on that subject to develop the record to see if this was an issue that needed to be further addressed. But I will say this, if any of the council members in fact hold views about Ms. James' removal, which were not subject or suspect, susceptible to change based on what's in the record, then you should think about that and recuse yourself from this vote. To remove Ms. James from office, the city council had to prove that just cause exists. Under the emotion rules, uh, the city had the burden of proving that misconduct related to the duties of the council member's office occurred and that just cause exists to remove the council member from office. So both things are identified in the emotion rules. Proving misconduct related to the duties of office is just one of the ways to establish that just cause exists. So the city of Monroe has alleged that Ms. James engaged in non-criminal misconduct in office and evidence indicating that any of the alleged misconduct in office was criminal would strengthen that, but criminal conduct is not required in this type of an analysis. So this is designed to try to make it a little bit more clear. You start at the top um, on this screen. It's very, very small, so I will look at it. <laughs> Probably having the same experience. Start at the top. Just cause is required to remove an elected official from office. And below, there are three options of how you get there, right? Option one, criminal misconduct in office. Have Ms. James been charged and convicted of criminal misconduct in office? That is just cause you're there, right? Option two, non-criminal misconduct in office, and that's what the city has alleged. And option three, um, an offense not related to office, but so infamous as to render the council person unfit for office. So our focus has really been on non-criminal misconduct in office with an asterisk around the criminal piece, which we'll talk about. Um, but once you've proven, as I believe the city has done, that there's non-criminal misconduct in office, then just cause does exist. So, Based on the evidence and arguments presented by the parties, I concluded that Ms. James engaged in misconduct related to the duties of her office and that just cause exists for three primary reasons. The first, although not charged, the evidence indicates that Ms. James committed a criminal assault and battery against Officer Acock when she grabbed his face mask at Atrium Health Union Hospital. So from a criminal law perspective, what we're talking about here is whether the conduct itself was criminal, not whether she was charged. We'll get to that in a second. So a battery under criminal law in North Carolina is an unlawful, unwanted touching. It's pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes the touching is slight. This one was, I, I wouldn't describe as slight. Officer Acock said he was shocked and that he did not consent. That's what goes to the element of a criminal battery under North Carolina law. In addition, this was an officer. And an assault on an officer is a misdemeanor under North Carolina law. So both of these, this action constituted not one but two potential criminal charges against Ms. James. Now she wasn't charged because she was a council person, right? So if I walked up and I had been the one who grabbed that mask off Officer Acott's Face, there's no telling what would have happened. But he testified because of her particular position and her particular authority, he exercised his discretion not to charge her. The question then, the next question in that analysis was, well, is any of this linked to her duties in office? 
And the answer to that is yes. We're not talking about a physical dispute between Ms. James and one of her neighbors. They get into a little altercation in the backyard. That's not necessarily related to her duties in office. But this is, because this is an officer of the law in this city. The police are here to serve and protect this community. And through the governance of the city, through your responsibilities as city council people, you're governing the processes of the city, which includes the police department. It would be in a corporate setting as if a senior employee engaged in inappropriate conduct with a more junior employee in a different department, right? It's sort of an agency idea. If that senior person engages in inappropriate conduct with a more junior person in another department, they're still going to get in trouble and are probably going to get fired. Whether or not that happened on the job or off the job, you're still responsible for that person in your senior role. But it's even more direct here because of the nature of Ms. James' role as a council person. Ms. James <clears throat> specifically worked on issues of public safety in this community. She served on the public safety committee that the mayor has established of the city council that works obviously closely with the fire department and the police department and others to maintain public safety in our community. Her actions with respect to Officer Acock and her other actions run completely foul of that, of those responsibilities, of that role as a part of the city council. So in my view, this is directly related to her uh, role and her duties as a city council person because of the city council person officer relationship. So that's one of the reasons why I believe that misconduct has occurred, that set of behaviors with Officer Acock. The second, of course, is that Ms. James violated the city charter and the city council's code of ethics when she purported to fire and promote police officers and tried to physically remove Captain Boland's police badge. The charter, the city charter, specifically provides the council members shall not direct the activities of any city employee directly or indirectly except through the city manager. That is an express prohibition. That express prohibition was violated repeatedly and you heard about it when we walked through that timeline. Directing the chief to retire, directing the chief to search the hotel, directing the officers to go room to room, directing the officers to arrest the felons in the room. Hiring, firing, promoting, demoting, demanding the badge of the captain. In each one of those individual instances, those are violations of an express, an express prohibition of the city charter. There are also violations of the code of ethics. Grabbing the badge particularly is particularly egregious in that circumstance because she's exercising physical authority over Captain Bolin in that scenario. This is all part, this is the second reason why we have this, the violation um, in the misconduct because of those violations of the express prohibition in the city charter. Finally, Ms. James violated the city charter and the city council's code of ethics when she made multiple false reports to police that put individual safety at risk. Each of those individuals in the lobby of the hotel, the Fairfield Inn and Suites, were residents or visitors to the city of Monroe. Directing the chief on his personal cell phone and officers on the scene to search them, to arrest them, to pursue them, that's all the filing of false reports. Now that's not criminal conduct, because under North Carolina law, for a false, the filing of a false police report to be criminal, there has to be malicious intent. And we did not see any evidence of malicious intent in this record. But it is dangerous, right? Dangerous to those individuals, dangerous to the safety of the other individuals in, in the facility. And also violates, again, that express prohibition about directing individuals. So each one of those reports, not made through normal channels, but made directly to the officers violate the prohibition on directing the, the actions of city employees unless through the city manager. 
For each of these reasons, I've reached the conclusion that just cause exists in this case. So as a hearing officer, I, I do not recommend um, how the city should vote. I want to be really clear about this. Uh, if I were to tell you how to vote, I believe I would be exceeding my authority in this scenario. There's very little case law on this issue because this doesn't happen a lot. Um, but in a recent case in Berger, the court remanded um, a Board of County Commissioners vote to remove a commissioner because their decision was not on its face limited to the evidence in the record. So had I put a recommendation in here that was not derived from the record, that's just my opinion about what you should do, and you relied on it, you would run the risk that you would be deciding on something outside of the record. So I worked very hard to make sure that I gave you the information that you needed to help you navigate through that record, but that's the reason why you didn't get a recommendation from me as to how you should vote. I find that rationale and burger to be persuasive. If you agree with me, based on your own independent analysis of the record that just cause ex exists, then I recommend that you consider a number of factors when you determine how to vote. Now this list of factors in the report is not intended to be exhaustive, but I think it is instructive. So this is just a flow chart for how this should work. If you, we had gone through this exercise and determined that just cause did not exist, then the council would have to vote against removal as a legal matter. No just cause, no removal. But in the event of just cause, you have discretion to determine how to move forward as it relates to removal. So there are a number of factors that we laid out for you to consider. First, and importantly, Ms. James has contributed to this community over nearly two decades. She's lived here in the city of Monroe, worked hard, coached youth basketball, operated a nonprofit sports camp, and according to her testimony, has had positive impacts on the community. That's also reflected in the affidavits that were submitted on her behalf. That deserves your consideration. Second, emotion proceedings are unusual, but they are part of a valid democratic process. Setting aside the decision of electorate is, is something you shouldn't take lightly, um, but the reality is that the voters can't address this issue until November 2023. And voters elect city council people to perform all of their duties. And voting in an emotion proceeding is one such duty. A decision by the electorate cannot be made for a year and a half, and so for now, this decision lies with you. Third, a vote to remove Ms. James does not prevent her from running for re-election in 2023. Indeed, come that next election, Ms. James could go to the community, she can make her argument, she can show how she's doing, and the community would then be in a position to decide for itself whether it wanted to re-elect her. But again, this becomes a timing consideration. So for now, your consideration should be around good governance. Fourth, Ms. James presented no evidence indicating that she's received plans or that she has plans or has received mental health treatment or is taking steps to determine whether these events may occur again. That also deserves your consideration as you're weighing what to do. Fifth, not removing Ms. James could negatively impact public confidence in the city council. Council members are expected to behave in a particular way, follow certain standards of conduct. Without public trust, governance is nearly impossible. This entire proceeding should be one of a consideration of good governance. There's been some discussion that might suggest that this could be a punitive exercise of removing Ms. James. And I mentioned this in my report, but I think it's important to repeat here. 
This should not be a punitive exercise. This is entirely about what is needed to govern this community the period of time between now and the next election. It should not be about penalizing her actions or making sure she doesn't get away with something. There's nothing to penalize here. This was a terrible set of events that involved a woman who's worked hard in this community. The only question is, what does the city need from a governance perspective from today moving forward? Final observation for your consideration. I mentioned earlier the Parker Poe report. And in that circumstance, you'll recall dating back to 2012, 2013, <coughs> there were council members who were exercising influence um, and appropriately so, over employment or personnel decisions involving city employees. And in that set of circumstances, no council members were removed. There are factual differences, significant ones, between Ms. James' conduct and the conduct at issue in the Parker Poe investigation. But those two incidences share one similar theme, exceeding authority in interactions with City of Monroe employees. Ms. James is black, and the elected officials at the center of Parker Poe's investigation were all white. Removal of Ms. James in this circumstance could well raise a question as to whether race is a factor. This city council should consider, and if appropriate, address this dynamic in your deliberations as you vote on this question. And now I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Any questions from any member of council? I would say she's very thorough. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McDowell. Uh, the chair will call now for a 10-minute recess. We'll meet back here at uh, 548.